Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. History is what happened in the past. Doing history is how we understand the past. Doing history is locating, selecting, assembling, and interpreting historical artifacts. At the Omohundro Institute, our special focus is on early American history, but our mission is broad. We support historical research and help make it great. We've been doing that for more than seven decades. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to a special bonus episode of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. History tells us who we are and how we came to be who we are. Its study tells us about people, how they lived and interacted with one another. The past informs our present, but how do we know what we know about the past? If history is inherently about people, what do we know about the people behind history's scenes? The historians. Who are these people who tell us what we know about our past, and how do they come to know what they know? This is what the Doing History series is all about. Meeting historians, finding out what they know about the past, and peeling back the layers on what they know so we can find out how they came to their knowledge. Each episode will feature a guest historian who will share stories from their research and then reveal how they came to know those stories. Think of each episode as a behind-the-scenes look at what we know about the past. Doing History episodes will air on the last Tuesday of each month, throughout 2016. Each episode will answer your questions about how historians work, how they research, how they write, and how they interpret historical sources. Today's special bonus episode is meant to help us better understand historians. I interviewed four accomplished historians to find out what they think the study of history is, why they do the work that they do, and about the ways they present what they know about the past to the world. In this episode, you will hear from Rebecca Onion, the history writer from Slate.com, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner Alan Taylor, Carolyn Winterer, the director of the Stanford Humanities Center and a co-author of the Digital History Project, Mapping the Republic of Letters, and Pulitzer Prize winner Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. The insights and stories they shared are so interesting and revealing that the only way I could think to share them with you is through a story. That's right, this is my first storytelling episode, a special format for a special episode. Are you ready to get to it? Let's begin. Historians are a curious group of people. They live amongst us in the present, but they also live with at least part of their mind in the past. Historians are human time travelers. They visit past places, peoples, and times. Their time machines take the form of books, documents, oral traditions, and seemingly mundane objects like tables and chairs. When you can catch a historian in the present, they will regale you with the stories about the people they have just met or the events they have just witnessed. Of course, unless they are historians of the mid to late 20th century or early 21st century, They haven't actually met the people they speak of or actually witnessed the battles, peace sessions, or pivotal moments in human history that they talk about. But for historians, the people and events they study often seem very real and alive. That's because historians spend a lot of time sitting in libraries and archives, sifting through their time travel materials, documents, objects, and oral traditions, what they like to call the historical record. So who are these people who live in the present, but also in the past? And why did they decide to become human time travelers? To be really honest, it's fun. (laughs) I mean, the work is hard. The work is not always fun, but detective work. And I find that 
satisfying and intriguing. I like sleuthing in libraries on on the internet in you know back corners of museums and attics literally i I really enjoy it. It's fun it, in a more kind of exalted way. It helps me make sense of the world, helps me understand why human beings do the things that they do in a particular time and place, you know, where ideas came from, how words have changed meanings. You know, old photographs look funny. I mean, why do people wear the things they wore then? And the understanding difference among people, feeling stretched to be able to sympathize with things that we might think are ridiculous today. Well, I'm, I was looking to get a more of what I would call depth perception in time uh, of the world that we live in. So I, the more that I studied history, uh, the better I thought that I understood the world that I live in. And I thought that it would be helpful for other people to also have that depth perception. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, the 300th anniversary professor at Harvard, and Alan Taylor, the Thomas Jefferson Chair of American History at the University of Virginia, both Pulitzer Prize winners, and both became historians because they want to figure out how the present time they live in came to be how it is. Is this really why historians become historians, to use the past to explain the present? Well, I like imagining lost worlds. When I was a kid, I just loved reading about places and times that I could never go. I loved reading about the planet Jupiter. I loved reading about asteroids. I loved reading about the age of the dinosaurs. I just loved reading about these mysterious places. And one of the wonderful things about being a historian is that you can put yourself into that lost world. One of the things that I tell my students is how quickly the past recedes from us. And, you know, for my students who were born in the mid-1990s, eras that seem very familiar to us, the 1970s, the 1980s, are for them already lost worlds. And so for me, that is just an endlessly wonderful part of, of studying history is being able to recreate that lost world, which I also think has the added benefit of being a very humanizing process. Yes, historians want to understand the past so they can provide context for the present. But some like Carolyn Winterer, the director of the Stanford University Humanities Center, also love the fact that studying the past opens the way for their minds to travel in time. Visiting lost worlds makes history fun for historians. Carolyn also mentioned that recreating lost worlds through historical study can make historians and others who read and study history more human. Can the past really make us more human? If so, how does that work? When we consciously try to put ourselves in the mind of another person, we are forced to see the world from their perspective. And when we are historians, we are always doing that. We are trying to see the world from the perspective of somebody who lived in another time and place. And I like to think in my optimistic moments that this makes us better people today, the ability to sympathize with other points of view. So I would say that's that's one of the major reasons that I became a historian. The historians I spoke with all became historians to make sense of the world around them and to learn how to be better people in their present. What do they all make of history? Is history merely the study of people who lived or events that happened before we were born? History is a story about the past based on surviving evidence. So the two parts of that that I really like students to understand is that it's not what happened. It's a story or a reconstruction of some kind about what happened, but that historians can't just make it up. They use the information that they can get, the clues, the insights from fragments 
of the past that have survived. History is a dialogue between present and past. It has to be because the source material is coming from an earlier time, but the historian lives in the present and has to engage with that. And history, I really like to emphasize, is about change. It's not about, you know, the old, moldy, forgotten things. It's not about escaping to some long-lost place. It's about understanding what changes and what doesn't change in human experience. So it's very dynamic, and it deals with some really fundamental historical problems and questions. So I would define history as an explanation of something in the past that answers a question and that ideally should involve research on the part of the historian. But to me, what's really essential for historical inquiry is that there be a question that is driving it. And we know that some of the great histories that have been written in the past have all answered big questions. Uh, We can start with Polybius. How did Rome rise to become the dominant world power? And then Polybius's history answers that question. As defined by Laurel Ulrich and Carolyn Winterer, history represents both the people and events of the past and the process of recovering and making sense of those people and events. Why is this work important? Why must historians recreate the past? And what can the past really tell us about the present? Alan Taylor offers us an answer. Well, it's pretty apparent that we uh, have not ended up in a post-racial America. It seems that that race is very powerful and uh, affects all of us. Um, but it certainly affects African Americans more powerfully and often in very harsh ways. And I see in much of the discussion about um, Black Lives Mattering and the stereotypes that that many Americans still have about uh, African Americans as disproportionately dangerous is something that resonates very deeply with what I could see in the early republic, where the primary justification for retaining people in slavery was that it would be too dangerous to allow them to persist as free people and the neighbors of white Americans. And so in the early republic, there there was a pretty widespread recognition that slavery was evil, that it was exploitative, And yet people would justify it by saying that that their own safety required them to do this. And the the most vivid expression of this is Thomas Jefferson's famous statement that slaveholding is like holding a wolf by the ears, that justice says you let the wolf go, but self-preservation says that you hang on. So I came to understand that quotation much more clearly when I read how Virginians were writing about enslaved people who were escaping from them and helping the British to wage the War of 1812 against the United States. Looking at how Virginians, like Thomas Jefferson, wrote about and justified slavery helps us understand our present. It helps us understand that the insecurity many white Americans feel around African Americans and that African Americans feel around white Americans dates to the beginning of our nation. Ideas we hold today came from ideas people thought over 200 years ago. Perhaps this knowledge will help us put our present thoughts and attitudes in perspective. Perhaps our enlarged perspective will help us solve the problems of race that pervade and confront American society. This makes the work of presenting history to the world an important job. If historians can help us see different viewpoints and the humanity inherent in people, If they can offer us perspective on how we came to be where we are as a society and culture, then it seems like we should be paying attention to the work that they do. But where do we look? Where do we find information about the past? Are we just limited to books and articles and journals by historians for historians? Rebecca Onion is the history writer for Slate.com. 
I spoke to her because she makes active use of the World Wide Web to disseminate history and to bring it to the attention of as many people as possible. So the Slate job also now, as of about a year ago, um, my title is history writer. And that means that it's a combination of the blogging that I do and also longer pieces. So periodically between two and three times a month, depending on the month and how complicated the piece is and how busy my editor is, I'll publish a longer piece. Sometimes it's a piece about some kind of research that is going on, you know, within academic history. Sometimes it's a piece about something that's happening in a museum or in education or sort of in popular history, like it's just people talking to each other. So I do that um, this past summer, in summer 2015, I did a podcast with Jamel Bowie, who's a slate, I guess now his title is Chief Political Analyst. And we did a History of American Slavery podcast. So that was a nine episode, or might have been 10 episodes in the end, I can't remember, a series where each episode started with the biography of an enslaved person and sort of tackled a couple of thematic issues that arise from talking about that person's life. Rebecca's work also invites its readers to try their hand at historical work. Her regular column, The Slate Vault, highlights a document, photograph, or material object from the past and invites viewers to envision the past and think about what we know and don't know about historic people and events. And there are 300 word posts about the documents that I look for are the ones that are sort of compelling in various ways on various levels. So there are the kinds of things that, you know, you might find in an archive as a researcher and say, oh my God, I can't believe, you know, you stare at it. Like, this is so interesting. It's so rich. Like, I want to look at it forever. In my text, I try to show that a document can be read and a bunch of, can have sort of both historical significance and also can be read in a bunch of different ways. Like, the, you know, I try to quote scholars who've written about the document in question who might, you know, have offered some kind of like interpretation for what it means. So I try to model in some way the way that a historian might look at a document like that, might use it both to like prove a fact about what actually happened and also to show, um, you know, to advance an argument in some way to say, okay, this is what this thing tells us about the way X, Y, or Z historical trend was progressing or this is why this thing shows that a conventional narrative is incorrect. And so in that way, I'm try- I am trying to say, like, look at, these, look at these documents. Like, there is a way to both, like, know what you can know about them and also to know, um, like, the, the gaps in our knowledge about them. I also try to include that stuff. Carolyn Winterer and other historians on the Mapping the Republic of Letters project are also using the internet and computers to assist their research and to bring that research to the world in new and novel ways. Since 2008, the Mapping the Republic of Letters project based out of Stanford University has explored the social and intellectual networks of 18th century philosophers, scientists, and thinkers like Voltaire, John Locke, and Benjamin Franklin. Over the last 50 years, institutions and documentary editing projects like the Papers of Benjamin Franklin Project, have been collecting correspondence to and from men like Franklin and publishing what they collect in annotated volumes. And for the last 20 years, documentary editors, historians, archivists, and other historical professionals have been digitizing these volumes and uploading them to the internet for all of us to use. The Mapping the Republic of Letters project team has taken these digitized records and put them into a computer system that they have created to look at and analyze all the letters produced by the 18th century philosophers, scientists, and thinkers that they study. I asked Carolyn how computers and digitization has changed the way that she and other digital historians work. How have computers and the algorithms that they run changed how historians research and what they know about the past? You're pointing to one of the very interesting things that can happen during digitization is that you can place your archive in a spatial dimension. So you can see things in a way that you could not before. So what we've been able to see by comparing Ben Franklin and Voltaire, which was really, really surprising to us, is that Ben Franklin's correspondence network reaches 
all across the Atlantic. His three major nodes of correspondence are Paris, London, and Philadelphia. Now, this will surprise none of your listeners. <laughs> we know this about Ben Franklin. But what was interesting is when we put this alongside Voltaire's correspondence network, we saw that only one of Voltaire's letters ever crossed the Atlantic Ocean. And it wasn't even one that Voltaire himself wrote. It was one that he, he received from a French scientist working in South America. So that was really, really interesting to us to see that both of these major figures in the Republic of Letters in the late 17th and 18th centuries had enormous amounts of influence during their time and place, but that the shape of their correspondence network was very, very different. Another thing we saw, just turning now to Ben Franklin alone, is that his network never reached into certain areas. Um, Africa is a dark spot on his letter network. He received a couple of letters from North Africa, but these are British or British American people living in North Africa. So when we think about the Atlantic world, which, which is a concept that has really influenced a lot of historians, we need to remember that the Atlantic world is not the whole Atlantic in a lot of cases, that many people like Ben Franklin were very confined to a particular part of the Atlantic world. We need to be careful as historians when we're using these large geopolitical concepts and to to be sure that we are speaking in specific ways about those. Computers help non-historians see and learn interesting things about the past, too. A visit to the Mapping the Republic of Letters website allows all visitors to visualize Franklin's communications and social networks where he sent letters, places where he received letters from, and with whom he corresponded. And in case you missed that, I just said social networks. This is something that we like to think is new and novel to us today. How many times have we wished that we could live in the past so we wouldn't have to deal with our full inboxes, Facebook friends, or Twitter followers? But you know what? Historians remind us that although our technology has changed, Human interactions and the joys and frustrations that they bring are as old as humans. So I asked Carolyn, how did Franklin cope with his social network? Everybody kind of comes up with their own coping mechanism. One of the coping mechanisms that Franklin has, because he's just at a certain point around 1776 in Paris, he just becomes completely overwhelmed by the amount of correspondence that he has. Just tons and tons and tons of people start writing to him for a variety of reasons. We all know this feeling, right? When you open your email and you have 67 new messages and you think, oh, how am I ever going to you know, reply to all of these? So first he just stops replying <laughs> to a lot of people. And then he also starts complaining about the amount of correspondence that he has. He starts complaining somewhere around the mid 1760s. And I just love this because you know, I had sort of thought that complaining about your social network was something new to our time period, but it turns out that you can already find it in the middle of the 18th century. And it made me sort of wonder, you know, how much earlier in time does complaining about your social network uh, go? You know, did Cicero complain about writing his letters? I don't know. Historians study the past to better explain the present, to make us more human and to help us see the ways that humans and their societies have changed and stayed the same over time. The study of history tells us who we are and how we came to be where we are as a society. If we watch the patterns and learn from the mistakes of the people from the past, then perhaps we can create a better future. This is how the study of history works, why historians study the past, and why doing history is important. I hope you enjoyed my story about the conversations I had with Rebecca Onion, Carolyn Winterer, Alan Taylor, and Laurel Ulrich. I know it's a bit different from the straight interview format we normally have on the show, but sometimes change is good. And I have to tell you, I have really wanted to try my hand at producing a storytelling episode for a while, and now I've had a chance to do it. 
I'd like to thank the Omohundro Institute for sponsoring the Doing History series and for partnering with me to help answer your questions about how historians know what they know about the past. Each episode in this year-long series will air on the last Tuesday of each month throughout 2016. For more information about the Omohundro Institute, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OI or visit the show notes page for this episode, where I have also posted links for the four historians we spoke with today, the Mapping the Republic of Letters project, and Rebecca's blogs and podcast on Slate. You can find the show notes at benfranklinsworld.com slash historians. If you have any questions or feedback about today's show, please send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.